JD in Montreal, then I went to CFCF, and then I went back to CJD. So at that point I was doing, yeah, noon to three. And the occasional Saturday. That's right. And that's and where we met up. Yeah, then I moved into the mid-morning slot, the uh, McKenty slot on CJD. And then I took a powder. But so we worked then and, and now. That's <laughs> took only a powder. Part. I went to Toronto. <laughs> Great story. Joe, who considers himself uh, a sports not knowledgeable. Knowledgeable. I was, I was no, say not expert, really, you know. No, I don't I, consider myself that at all. Well, that's how it comes across. How about a sports fan? <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan, but I don't consider myself. 1982 World Series. And I, I'm, just, I'm just starting out at, at CJD. Yeah, I'm a little nervous. Yeah, I'm Joe Cannon. So I, I come in. <laughs> not that big I was there. It's not now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I, I was somebody then. <laughs> so I, I sit down. And I, I've heard Joe, uh, you know, talk to the sports guys, and he, he always has an opinion, you know. So, so I sit down, and uh, I say, uh, Mitch was off at, at the World Series covering it for the station. And I said, uh, Joe, Cardinals, Brewers, World Series, game one, what do you think? He says, you're the sports guy. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? That was very insensitive of me, wasn't it? Thank God, God, thank you. Thank, thank goodness you've evolved. Thank God I'm older and much more sensitive now to things like that. Well, you worked in Toronto. You worked at a couple places in Toronto, but you worked at the Fan in Toronto just before just they before became, became the Fan. The fan right? Yeah, they were a semi. They were a sort. Of, when I was there, we were kind of a hybrid. We were a, an oldies sports station. Uh, the morning show was a bit of oldies music, uh, a lot of sports, uh, not, not dissimilar to what we're doing right now on CIQC, but uh, it, was a, it was a good format and we had a pretty good audience. But decisions had been made at the very top to make it an all-sports station and the uh, people from New York, one of the old uh, fan guys in New York, one of their ex-GMs was their consultant and he said, if you're going to change, you've got to change. Don't mess around with this thing. Don't. They were thinking of going all-sports maybe from 10 in the morning or from noon and he said, no, either you do it or you don't do it. And it, it, that includes your morning show. And we talked about it, and it was, you know, th there was no way I could do a, an all-sports morning show. I'm not, first of all, I'm not knowledgeable enough, and frankly, I, I would go crazy talking about sports all the time. It would drive me nuts. I mean, uh, even you, Mitch, I, I'm surprised that you can sit there and talk just sports two hours a day on CIQC, because I know that you are interested in a lot of other things, and that you have the, the, the knowledge and the ability to express yourself on practically any subject under the sun. Don't you find it constraining or uh, no, not at all. doing no. just sports? Not for the next couple of years. The next couple of years is Fair fine. Enough. It's, it's yeah. not hard to do. Well, that's a real hard job, uh, that two hours a day working way. Well, well, wait a minute. It's very difficult. What minute. would you know, a lawyer, my God? Yeah, I would like to see work. you have <laughs> sat in there for two hours during no baseball and no hockey and take exactly. those callers every day. Uh, I Let's didn't do it every day, but I did it. and It was extremely difficult. Look what it's done to this man. He used to have a full head of hair. Look at him. Now, what I meant was that it's not so tortured is to talk about sports two hours a day when you have 22 other hours of the day to pursue other interests and sports well, yeah, yeah, but the thing and is family. You don't have 22 hours. Well, the you show doesn't magically appear on the air like that. People think you come in, you read five minutes of sports, and then you go home. Yeah. How does it get that? to 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 yeah, paper to do. the information? It takes exactly. Can you bail me understand. out here? You do listen to music, There's you no read newspapers, you, you read the news. I don't listen to. I have not read a a fiction book, a fiction book since my honeymoon. You read the papers? The newspaper? I, re I read Well, I, I have the new Kinsella for you. So you read the political <laughs> stuff in the papers? <laughs> yes, I That's get fiction. to it eventually. That's fiction. <laughs> You've been That's reading fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But, I mean, there are things I don't listen to enough music, as much music as I right. want to listen to. I don't have a car. You have two young kids, car. though. That, that, that yeah. no, 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 but a the, bit of one's time. The, the difference is, is the car, because uh, I listen to, like, 80% of the music yeah. I listen to in the but car. But there are well, so you know, many papers and magazines. It was so refreshing to go to the fantasy camp or any little break that you get, so you don't have to pour over every word that's written about sports or uh, it, it, take a break from the TV. It's, it's very refreshing. to. I, that's where I find, that's where I do get into some of the other things yeah. that I'm interested in. Tell you what, we, we, talk, we talk about radio, and radio, I think, is better now than it has ever been. I think there's more on the dial now than ever before. And even in Montreal, with CIQC's format now, getting into the the mainstream of talk and I think finally getting our act together and it's been a slow painful process there's no question about that but I think we really now are getting our act together with some very talented people on the radio and I think talk radio as proven in the states is an, is an exciting venue to do your thing 
Uh, it, it gives you marvelous opportunities for expression of opinion that really aren't available on TV. This, is, this show gives that kind of opportunity a half hour at a time. Talk radio does it over and over, hour by hour. Sure, sometimes it's convoluted, boring, uh, repetitive, all of the above, but sometimes, a, a lot of the time, <laughs> it's stimulating. I mean, there are many days, uh, as I said, I'm not only interested in sports, but I, I'll catch Mitch's show some days, and uh, you know, I've shown up late for squash games because I can't drag myself away from it because uh, he's really into it, the, into the real subjects of sport. And, I, and uh, the reason I find it fascinating is because the sport talk that you do based on, on labor difficulties, I really do believe it's a microcosm of what's happening out there. I think it's more than sport. Well, that was a very good point you made earlier about the, the country. It's all, you know, you can't separate all of these things. Sport is not the sandbox of life. It's, in many cases, it's real life. What are you, what are you trying to do in the morning? Guy wakes up, lady wakes up, no time to read the paper cover to cover. What are you trying to do? Someone has 16 minutes to listen to no. you, either in the car on the way to work, or four minutes before getting to the shower, and then another four afterwards, and then maybe another eight in the car. What are you trying to give uh, the Try and give them a feel for what the day's all about. I'm not a joke teller. I've never been a good joke teller. And I always figure if you're not a good joke teller, don't try and tell jokes. And, <laughs> That's you know, very good conclusion really. to reach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Just don't try. I have too many guys. A lot of people haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, a lot of bad joke tellers on the radio. But uh, I like to give people Care a name feel. A few? <laughs> I, just a feel for the day, what the day's all about. Now, sometimes your feel for the day is not, is not You're not in sync. sync. You're not in sync some days. You, you, frankly, I think we get in too early sometimes. I'm in there at 4.30 every morning. I get on the air at 5.30, and sometimes you're not in sync with what's really happening out there. Uh, sometimes I think they should l let us get up later. <laughs> or do the, the show from home. Well, that's, <laughs> Elliot's, that's what Elliot does, right? That's, that, that's I mean, Elliot's you, philosophy, right? Come in as, as close to showtime is what, two minutes before your time? Yeah. Well, actually, every, everything's, everything's done the night before. The difference between news and sports, of course, is that after I go to sleep, not very much is going to happen between then and True. when I come in in the morning. Yeah. Uh, anything Australian rules? Well, I can just add that on at the end. That's very easy. When you have everything done, if it's just one exactly. item, it's, it's not a big deal. So I come in uh, three minutes before my first sportscast, but I've already put in an hour and a half's work the night before. You, you've worked at more places and listened to more radio stations across this country than I have, mm -hmm. but I doubt that there's a better radio sportscaster in this country than him. But I, oh, not, not that I've heard. It. No, no, he's very good. You guys are, I, I think you two as a team on my show in the morning are the, are the best around, frankly. Well, I'll tell you what, I was, I was very proud to uh, work at, at a radio station that had uh, what I thought were uh, two of the best young up-and-coming sportscasters, and Bob Dunn assembled a staff uh, yeah. of uh, myself, Mitch Melnick, and Chris Cuthbert, where uh, the three of us, Dunn not included, were all 25 years or, or under. That's more than a decade ago, and uh, things have turned out Can okay. I, can I tell you a little quick story about Elliot? I, I didn't realize Elliot was doing play-by-play. -play. I was in Toronto. I kind of lost touch with the local scene. Drove in one day from Toronto. Turned on the Expos. I think I picked them up on Belleville, CJBQ in Belleville, 800 down the 401. And I hear this guy. I, the, the, who's the guy that was on, did this stuff before Troupiano. you? Uh, yeah, Troupiano. I didn't like him. I'd met him, and I liked him personally, but I didn't like his style on the air. Oh, Red Sox hired him. So a year later, I'm driving down the highway, and I hear this guy doing play-by-play -play of the Expos broadcast. And I know Elliot, right? But I don't recognize the voice. And, when he's, and, and I'm saying, God, this guy's great. This guy's terrific. I said, he's better than Matt Horn. And then I found out it was when is, Elliot. When is this running? <laughs> no, really. Uh, Dave will still be in Florida. I, I was absolutely <laughs> flabbergasted. Jim Van Horn. By, by, <laughs> by how quickly Elliot had developed this uh, ability to do play-by-play -play of a very difficult well, he's game. He's been doing it all his life. Baseball's tough. Right? I'll tell you what. The, the Expos were, were very kind to the point of allowing me uh, giving me, they said, you want to learn how to do this? Here's the press box all to yourself. Uh, okayed by everybody in the organization. There's no job for you right now, but if you want to practice every day, uh, you can do that. And uh, I dragged Mitch in with me, or Rich Griffin, uh, yep. someone to help me out on color, and I just, I just did it. And that's really the only way to do it. On that same subject, by the way, uh, here I am talking about how I marveled at you and you start. Rich Griffin. I've been following Rich's work in the Toronto Star for the last. It's unbelievable. Of weeks. It's yeah. unbelievable. Did you wonder what, what the heck was he doing what for the a last talent. ten years? I can tell you what he was doing. He was wasting all his good information on sports guys who were printing it in their papers <laughs> under <laughs> their own <laughs> byline. You're laughing, and, but and, it's true. And, and sometimes they would attribute it. And to one him. of them, Bob Elliott, who was the baseball columnist for the Toronto Sun now <laughs> will find out what it's like to go head to the head yep. with the guy that's been feeding him some stuff. His stuff years. is incredible and after only maybe 10 or 12 columns, maybe 15 yeah. as this is being aired, he could become one of the top sports columnists if he hasn't already is in it, the country. Well, a lot of the great... Hall of Fame? 
Oh, yes, she is. A yes. lot of the great sports First writers in Canada, of course, have been come from the American uh, scene, have uh, come up here from the States. Uh, after the difficulties. Careful, Rich and, is from uh, Jamaica. <laughs> rich, you know, guys who were running away from whatever, a war or different circumstances. And here we have an escapee from replacement baseball, <laughs> becoming one of the great <laughs> columnists in our country. I'm, it's quite a move. You know, the, the fact, uh, not to dwell on Rich, but the fact that he could do what he's done in the newspaper, he has, I think, talent that he could have used in a lot of other areas, too. It's not that he was a newspaper columnist waiting to happen. He probably was a lot of things to do with baseball waiting to happen, he's a, he's other than what he did. He's a very smart man. Yeah. And this kid who's replaced him, this Peter John Loyola, who's was the new PR guy. I grew up, he grew up with my kids playing baseball on the West Island. It's nice to see a West Island kid who loves baseball uh, realize his dream, now working in what we hope will soon be Major League Baseball. And he camped out to get that job Absolutely. in Ottawa. He, came, Absolutely. he would not go away. That's he, a went, great story. he went into the office of the boss. Yeah, yes. just walk in. Yeah, it said, and uh, he's a great kid from a great family, and it's it's wonderful to see how this this evolution of both of these guys. And, hey, you know it works. Hey, life works. This baseball strike is, is <laughs> killing you. Profound. I want to. We talked about. No, this baseball strike is not killing me. Please why is let it me not make killing? up my own opinions. All right. Why is it not? <laughs> why? It's so, so this baseball strike is killing you? Question mark. And no, this baseball strike right. is not killing me. First of all, there's nothing I can do about it. So, what am I supposed to do? Also, um, I mean, you had to. I've seen this coming. If, if you've been, and, and so many people turned a blind eye towards all this information that was coming towards them that uh, this thing was going to blow up in everyone's face. And, and like uh, even at the beginning of last season, I was telling people this is a possibility, but no one will listen until it's staring you right in the face. Well, welcome to it. You will be working, hopefully, 25 games this season, and, and from what I understand, Mike Stenhouse will be working alongside you. So you're both going to have your computers there because I know you're very much into computers now. So we look forward to hearing you at some point in 1995. I certainly look forward to having you hear me. <laughs> and in the meantime, you'll be on with Joe Cannon every morning, every and I'm morning. on with Elliot at 5 to 7. And if you miss him there, he'll be on the Internet. There that's you go. right. <laughs> Both these guys are on the Internet. And that's a, great, uh, that's a great thing. What's it called? Two-on-two -two sports, one-on-one -on -one sports? Boy, Boy, is this the mutual Five to seven, five days. It's a great spot. Well, it is. Right. It's a well, great we future. work together a lot. I don't like any of you guys. Well, so no, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never be okay, back. you can go now. <laughs> All right. Joe Cannon and Elliot Price, thanks a lot. For Mitch Melnick. Joe's on 5.30 to 10. We, we didn't get to that? No. We've been here for 30 minutes. No. 5.30 five to That's 10. That's right. CITC. A <laughs> Talk Radio, 600 Montreal. We'll be back next time on the Sports Hot Seat. Thanks for watching. The Sports Hot Seat is brought to you by Sport Buff, where you'll find the entire line of Starter Sportswear. Starter, now offering the most comprehensive 1-900 sports info and update line, 24 hours a day.
Welcome to the Sports Hot Seat. I'm Mitch Garber with uh, Mitch Melnick. And today, Mitch, two young radio talents who I think are going to go a long way in this business. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we welcome back Ted Blackman, who did this show last year. The only show we had to edit, by the way. No, the only show that had an editing mistake in it. Did yeah. I say a bad word? No, 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 no. no, no. no. It's, no it was just, us. We went long. Oh, we went it's long. the only show in three years. What did story. you cut out? Can we play it today? <laughs> <laughs> it was, we'll go short. <laughs> <laughs> George Balkan, who's back in this building where he used to work for a few years, right? Yeah. Sure. You? Nice, like being so home. So did I. It's like being, yeah. Well, that's right, of course. Yeah, we're heroes here. Did you work... We like, never work together here. It's like going back and visiting your own Mexican hotel room and the maid still hasn't made it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, your production values are much different than uh, yeah, we don't have it used any, to be years any. ago. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Well, on Channel 9, it used to be uh, no, no viewers and black and white and uh, no graphics or anything. And now, geez, you made me a star the last time I was here. Yeah. The biggest you know thing that, that happened to Ted in a long how time. long my, name, my picture hasn't been in the Gazette, and we work in the audio medium of, uh, of uh, radio, and I started to go out after uh, the show was on, and I'd walk in and see people I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis, like the clerk at Cumberland or the guy who pumped the gas at the Sunoco station on Sherbrooke, and, Blackman! <laughs> how do you know? Channel 9. You know, so Amazing. Yeah, and, I did, and I did that game show, that awful game show. Beat the clock. No. Mad Dash. Oh, you it's don't want to admit that one, right? It's your move. It's oh, it's your move. move. I'm sorry. It's your want... move, and I want to know when I'm getting my Z-brick. <laughs> Everybody gets paid. <laughs> Who did beat the clock? That or a year's supply of pantyhose, <laughs> Was which I don't What's his need. Name? Cameron. Uh... Who did beat the clock, George? Who did beat the clock? Yeah. Wasn't the guy's name Cameron? Uh... There were a series of guys. Ward Cornell? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Norris did beat the clock, didn't he? Yeah, they brought an American up. Okay. And it was so, so expensive, they decided that eventually they'd get Canadians. But that was that part of your whole deal when you came to CFCF Radio to do TV as well? It's your move and the, the, the movie no, show? No, originally, originally I came to uh, do uh, a game show and movies. And, that, and I was going to be still working at CJAD. Did you leave him? I mean, how, how were you... Did, was he, were no, you we've his always boss? been together. Who broke up with him? joined yeah. at the hip. <laughs> well, the, the historical parameters, uh, it's been 25 years now, on and off with a couple of delinquencies. <laughs> <laughs> he left for two years here, I left for two years here, that we've been together. But when I came there, it was largely because of George and the late Doug Williamson, who uh, thought that I uh, had, had turned out wrong, thought I could add something to their morning show. And so George was my... Uh, and my mentor back then. Yeah, I Do you accept him. that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Mac McCurdy one day called me in and he said uh, in his little corner office there at the corner of Mountain and St. Catherine, he said, I don't know what we're going to do with this Blackman guy. I'm afraid we're going to have to let him go. And I said, no, you can't. You can't possibly let him go. He's... Uh, He's uh, wonderfully well informed about the sports world. <laughs> he owes me too much money. <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta keep him working. <laughs> uh, we had a little thing going with the NFL at the time. And so, <laughs> so that was it. A pool and of sorts. So, and, so, uh, and so that's the way he got that morning show. He got that uh, morning so sports and, show. Uh, and it's about six years later, George leaves to go to, uh, to CFCF Radio, and the best morning man in Montreal, so they named me program director and say, you fight against them. <laughs> <laughs> it was impossible, so I stole them back. And, That's about uh, it. More or less uh, uh, in title only. Did you miss him? Did you I've miss been each his other? Boss, but we work like uh, you know Joe Montana and the rest of the backfield. Yeah. Did you miss each other, or was it a good time to have a break from each other at that point? No, it was difficult. It was really difficult because fundamentally, we'd worked together so long, and we were very good friends. And then suddenly, you are at each other's throats, business-wise, and it's difficult to remain friends and still have that camaraderie that we talk about in this game. And. Uh, and it was really difficult. It was two years of, of real hell because you get to rely and you understand how the other guy works really well, too. Yeah, you, know, you know, the only rationale I ever went on, maybe George agrees with it, too, although he can speak for himself, is I thought by being stiff competitors but while remaining friends through it all that we would tend to bring out the best in each other and that the listener would profit because we really had to work hard oh. for each uh, listener we got. Uh, 
because the other guy was doing something the next day, and if you got him, you knew he'd be back on Thursday with some new yeah. gimmick, and he'd get and you. So, you know, it was I was working at CFCF Radio, and and had to be working really hard at CJD, and that's how Shom suddenly rose up. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> split the vote. <laughs> yes. War of attrition. What did What did you learn from? I mean, you worked with these guys for how long? One or the other or both for how many years? Uh, Eighty-two at CJD till ninety. Till 92, so 92, 10 years. 11 years. The Did most important. 10 years? Yeah. Well, the thing that amazed me about George the first time I, I worked with him to fill in, when I used to fill in for Ted, was how well prepared. You said on a previous show, two hours on the air is not a tough job. <laughs> I know it was, you were being facetious, but how, I mean, he's got jokes indexed how often he's used them in 30 years and when the next appropriate <laughs> time lot. to use them is. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's obvious, and it shows on the air, and he reads everything, and, and that shows too. I mean, you've got to be, you got to do your homework. You don't do your homework, it shows. And that's one of the reasons for the success of, of their show and the, and the radio station there. George will teach you a lot about uh, preparation for a show. He'll teach you a lot about how you continually have to go out there and, 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 and work for the benefit of the community and those in it. He'll show you how to uh, keep your cool and remain professional under the most trying of circumstances. And he'll also lead you to the edge of the envelope. <laughs> push the, the frontiers. <laughs> of early morning, early morning radio <laughs> to the acceptable <laughs> limits of today. Yeah. Which are what? How far have you pushed it? Did you ever, ever go over the edge? Oh yeah, I think we've gone over the edge. Um, well, we certainly have changed. I mean, in the years that we have worked together, uh, 10 years ago, you could not possibly do today's radio because A, the vocabulary isn't the same. 10 years ago, you could not use the words you use today on radio, because communication is different. I mean, it's, it's Letterman and it's a whole bunch of other things, but people talk differently today than they did 10 years ago. When I started out in radio, you could not say a woman was pregnant. You could say that she was with child, but you couldn't even use the word pregnant. Now, knocked up is acceptable, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, it changes, it really does. Well, you look at the uh, primetime fair on television today and remember that Mary Tyler Moore wasn't allowed to, had to sleep in a twin bed, right? Yeah. Yeah, on the Mary Tyler Moore <laughs> show, and that's not that long ago. Yeah, that was still great uh, television. You guys are both fairly shy, from my experience. When you're not on here or not on the radio, and I don't know if that's a common theme with a lot of radio people, but I think in general the people who listen to you probably think that you are, you know, very extroverted, and probably yourself uh, yourself as well. You want to tackle that first? <laughs> don't forget, we work on a stage that is six by six and there's no one else there and there's no live audience. Perhaps we are shy and that's why by being alone uh, we can't entertain an audience we can't see and doesn't terrify us. And fundamentally to also on, on doing a morning radio program, you're talking with one person, you know, or maybe two at the outside. As we talk about old time radio, it, that was when Fibber McGee and Molly were on and dad used to say, come on mom, come over to the radio and listen to Fibber McGee and Molly. You don't have families going and listening to a morning radio program, very seldom anyway. You're lucky if you can get more than two members of the same family at the breakfast table together, let alone agreeing on what radio program to listen to. You know, so you're dealing with one person. That's why we're, we aren't really withdrawn, but we are more one-on-one -on -one people, I think. Well, I think the common thread is, I think a lot, most radio people is, you're not on once you're off. I mean, you, I, I think it would be difficult to live with or hang around with somebody in radio who's always on, even when they turn the microphone off, they're mm -hmm. still on. I think that's tough to take. Oh. Well, you know, but the, que the question is, how do you think your show would change if you did your show surrounded by 98,000 people live at one time? I'd be intimidated because I'd get off a one-liner and... Uh, 80 out of 100 people might laugh and 20 <laughs> might boo and hiss, and all I'd hear were the hisses. He's very I can't tell what they're doing when it's radio, you know, I, it's perfect by me. <laughs> He's very, very sensitive. He cannot take rejection, and that's, the, that's one of the things about his life. No, we do a thing called uh, Tickle Pink Breakfast as part of the Just for Last Festival, and we go out and we actually have breakfast with a couple of hundred people. And uh, to answer your question, it's alive and well, and we have some of the top comedians that come in from the Just for Last Festival, and we have a good time. I think it sparks the show. I love doing the show out there. Uh, but I tell you, it's underarm time. Uh, it, when it's live <laughs> and you've got 200 people or 300 people out there, 
uh, you sweat a lot. You really do, because you work twice as hard. Oh, more than that. But you also can understand the attraction of people who do enjoy performing in front of a live audience. The immediacy oh, yeah. and uh, the adrenaline rush when you know it's going okay. Well, you, Mitch, don't, you, feel you should it, ask right? Blackman, who does much more speaking than I do, and I haven't done any for a long while, but there is no greater thrill than going out and speaking to a group of people and finding the reaction alive coming back at you, the, the laughter, the, the reaction to what you're doing, the acceptance. There's also nothing like the rejection that I was talking no about. No more lonely <laughs> feeling than that. <laughs> you know, if you do it wrong, you really do it wrong. But when it's right, it's just fantastic. Yeah, when you bring the speech for a sports stag dinner to uh, so I, uh, the, the women of Hadassah and their annual <laughs> luncheon, you have the wrong speech. Wrong You're file. In deep <laughs> trouble. Uh, but we, we always carry spare scripts now in the glove compartment, so that doesn't happen. I can race down to the parking lot and save myself every time. Well, it's always good to poke fun at yourself, right? Yes, I, uh, that's the only time. I only enjoy it in the limelight when uh, I'm having a good time with uh, like George working together. It's a good uh, working existence. Or speaking where I'm in control of my script and can and make people laugh. I enjoyed that. I was class clown when I was a, a kid. But I've been taught uh, since the basics of journalism, you're not the story. And too many people forget that too often. You are not the story. The Montreal Canadiens are the story this week. Uh, Réjean Tremblay is not the story. Uh, well, he made himself the story. I know, he makes himself the story. Well, if you call that shyness, then I'm shy. I'd rather not be the story. One of the most embarrassing moments of my life was when Maury Wills took a slap at me. Uh, uh, I've told the story many times. I've laughed at it in a self-deprecating way. Uh, tell the Maury Will story again. I don't want to. I mean, I didn't want to be on the sports pages of any newspaper involved with it. I just wanted to cover it. Uh, I think too many people forget and think they are the story these days and uh, never get to the meat of what's available to them in the butcher shop. By the way, Mitch, this is uh, seat uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Seven, eight, nine. Well, I'm six. Right. Are you All right. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, five and five. <laughs> and five. I'm sorry. All right. Let me keep my seat for now. <laughs> for now. For now. Even yeah. Even if it's only uh, hypothetical. So you're a baseball fan. Yep. yep. You've, you're, are you a hockey fan too? So, yeah. Uh, you hang around him for uh, like decades. Yeah. You can't be anything. You have to be a hockey. You have to be a sports fan in this town, to some degree anyway. Um, I watched a, a show. One of your shows where he asked whether it was absolutely necessary for a morning broadcaster to be a sports fan. And yes, the answer is yes. You have to be somewhat of a sports fan, if not a real, true, dyed-in-the-wool sports fan. I love baseball. Uh, do you want to go any further than that? <laughs> <laughs> We've been, uh, Ted and I have been season ticket holders for in excess of 10 years. Yeah, George likes baseball. He'd have to tell you why. I mean, I like all sports. George seems to have a press uh, preference for baseball as a spectator, live spectator. Would mm -hmm. that be correct to say? Yeah. And perhaps be, be and George is also uh, a fine artist, and he is terrific at capturing uh, the human figure, especially when it's in emotion or exertion. And uh, I think you, uh, that's why baseball is so akin uh, to your taste, is that you, that's what you see. You see tremendous motion, you tr see tremendous athleticism, and it's, uh, it, it reminds me a lot of your paintings. Exactly what I would have said. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. You want me to, no, you want me no, to no, run no, your next no, no, tour? No, no, no it's, it's true. <laughs> you know, p people have described baseball as the reason it's so popular in the Orient is because it's an art form. And the movement, everything, every bit of it, is uh, is is a type of art. And I love the the slow motion of baseball. I really, do. I don't wait for the for the home run or anything else. I just love the motion of the people on the thing. It's a great, great sport. Wonderful to watch. Do you have a Balkan original? Yes, a couple. And prominent, prominently displayed. Oh, certainly. Uh, right next to the right next when to he the comes towels. over. Right, right. right next to right the towel. Right next to the TV. I, I, have a, I have a beautiful painting of a uh, of a woman that George did lifting a sack of grain on a street corner in what? In Haiti. In Haiti. And uh, people who know anything about painting at all and, and know much more than me will stop in front of that painting and they'll look at it and they'll just be mesmerized by it. And one of the things they point out is how 
they don't even notice it's a George Balkan signature. That painting, they go, uh, geez, how did that artist get that moment of exertion as that woman is just about to pick up that heavy load? And I say, because he's gifted. It's a George Balkan. He knows what he's doing. He does that. It's not just your hobby. Art's not just a hobby. No, no, no. Never was. Uh, I was a, I was a sports cartoonist. I was an editorial cartoonist uh, for many years. Uh, I had uh, two agents, one in New York and one in St. Louis. The one in New York sold cartoons to, uh, to ma major magazines, and the other guy sold, in St. Louis sold it to industrial magazines. I, you couldn't see very much of my work because I don't know whether you ever subscribe to uh, sluts uh, uh, <laughs> and other major male magazines. Uh, but uh, I did that for about five years. But he uh, has used the washrooms of the old Sir Winston Church of Pub. Oh, then you may have seen some of my <laughs> cartoons. And, and, I have subscribe, and I have subscribed to sluts. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a way of making a living, and I, it, I didn't make a living out of it. It added to what I did in radio. And... Uh, it was, it was fun. I how did long, sports cartoons, though, for the Hamilton Spectator for a little while. For how long years. do you spend? Do you spend every day, virtually every day, in your studio? You mean p painting in Yeah, in your studio. Yeah, well, I have a place down in St. Lawrence. I like the area. Uh, and uh, I go there and probably work seven or eight hours a day there, painting or getting ready for the next day's program. And he watches OJ. Or these days. <laughs> or whatever. Or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. You know. Before OJ, it was uh, the Menendez. Yeah, Menendez. Yeah, I got hooked on Court TV. It's terrible. <laughs> did you get Did you get Heidi Fleiss too? Or uh, I didn't it was watch. Too short. I didn't watch that or Bob it. No, I picked my cases. I. <laughs> I take my only, <laughs> hey, I don't watch anything. And the only reasons I do is if I had stayed in school, I, I would have had an ambition to become a lawyer, a trial lawyer and a defense a trial lawyer. Uh, from the age of 14, 15, I read everything I could on uh, on famous uh, cases. Uh, I was a big fan of anything Clarence Darrow had ever handled. For I the read, defense, great book. Uh, all, all those books. I, read, I owned about five books on the Leopold and Loeb case alone. I, I felt I was there in 19, uh, you know, uh, 12. That's whatever. a great case to bring up, the Leopold and Loeb case. A I case where two guys tried to, tried to pull off the perfect crime. Actually, that's why I've been in court so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I find my safe self uh, ways to get in trouble <laughs> with the authorities so that I can be in court and witness the trial. Do you have an OJ prediction? Uh, I mean, we'll keep this tape and, you know, one no, day... Uh, that's La La Land out there, you know. Uh, I mean, that's a town where anything can happen. Uh, you know, Dave Van Horn and I first visited L.A. in 1969 together, and we had a rented car, a convertible, from a Hertz people, and we left Dodger Stadium after the end of the ball game, and we were driving down Sunset Strip, which means you're driving at about one quarter mile per hour, and this whole world zoo was out there on the sidewalks, and you're edging your car ahead slowly and slowly and looking around at things. And this guy carrying pizzas, not in a cardboard box, two of them from one place across the street to a bar, was walking in front of the car when I was turned looking at Dave, and we just touched the crease of his pants, and he turned around, went berserk, <laughs> threw both pizzas <laughs> on the windshield, <laughs> And I made the mistake of turning the car washer on, which only cooled off the uh, cheese, and now it all <laughs> smeared there. And you couldn't see anything. It was pepperoni hanging out of Dave's hair, and we he had hair. As it, as it he then had was. At the time. <laughs> he, had, he had hair back then. He hadn't seen Carl Keel yet. I <laughs> remember. <laughs> we hadn't run up 120 losses. Dave had hair, and we abandoned the car. We called Hertz and said, we got a hit by a pizza on Sunset Strip. The guy said, fine, happens every day. <laughs> so that's, that's where this trial is being held. I watch it to see the Johnny Cochran's and the Marsha Clark's and the superstars go at each other. Who's your favorite dream teamer? I like Marsha. Oh, yeah? Yeah, she's under the most pressure there. The other guys have made all the reps. She is good. There's no she is good. little doubt that she yeah. is good. Did you guys live together? Yeah, occasionally off and on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We did no spring training. We did spring training <laughs> together for uh, for a couple of years. Uh, we, we when the Expos used to go to Daytona Beach, which was just a 
terrible, terrible place. I mean, nobody enjoyed it. It was awful. We always went down there, and it was right after Speed Week. Oh, yeah. And uh, there were a lot of guys in leather jackets there. <laughs> uh, with, the, with every motorcycle with the guy. With flashbacks here right yeah. now. <laughs> it's like this show threw up or something. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was, uh, that was a tough time. Uh, but we've had some great times together. We go to rock and roll shows together. We, uh, we heard Gord Lightfoot swear in Daytona Beach. Yes. He was doing one of his most wonderful ballads. He was doing a song called Beautiful. I don't know whether you're familiar with the song. It's a gorgeous song. And he was standing in, on the stage all alone with his guitar singing this song in the, uh, in the Civic Arena in that city. And a fellow rang out, shouted out from the, from the upper balcony, sing, he named another song. Edmund Fitzgerald or something. <laughs> was thinking of. Yeah. And Gord Lightfoot sang the next three words and then stopped. And in two words, famous Anglo-Saxon words, <laughs> told the guy exactly what to Meaning do. Meaning leave this place <laughs> yes. go to some other place. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then went right back to beautiful. Right back to the song. <laughs> he, didn't he didn't miss a word. Well, was, we saw that. Uh, Gord Lightfoot at his best. They were fun times broadcasting from down there. That the, was a different era, though, when we were first started going down there from mm -hmm. almost day one, eh, George? Right. Or, or, I mean, we'd, we'd have Rusty Staub and all the rest of them back in that era, and the ballplayers were making the same kind of dough we were making. So it was nothing to say to a, one of the, uh, any one of the starting players, can you give us five minutes? We're broadcasting live back to Montreal in the dugout here. They'd, drop, they'd walk out of the cage, and you know how the guys love their swings, eh? And come over and be interviewed. Today, you'd have to negotiate from a week in advance. Talk to With my the agent. agent. Yeah, talk to With my the agent. agent. Yeah. Some guys. Dykes, 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 how much? Dykstra, how much? Uh, Is that? How much? Jack Those we were the two words that yeah, were no. nice. <laughs> <laughs> How often did you guys really get stupid, crazy? Not enough. They're still here? We're still got jobs. <laughs> yeah. That's surprising. I, I've never thought of the question. So I've never really had to think about the answer. Uh, well, we get giggly now and then and go over the line a bit, but they accept it. And we get rebuffed uh, now and then when you're in ad lib radio. And you know, Mitch, from working at AD, we're always working in an ad lib form, and you don't know what you're going to say next. And you just, you've got to hope the brain's always engaged with the mouth, and sometimes it isn't. And one time, George just threw me a, a, a question about, uh, oh, by the way, Ted, Expo 67, did you go down there and see the. Uh, the Chinese uh, acrobat. Oh yeah, I, the exhibition. They were on cultural they were, tour. It was part of the cultural part of the of the expo, and uh, I said, "Did you go and see the <laughs> the Chinese dancers, the Chinese acrobats?" And he said, "Where?" And I said, "Place des Arts. They were here last night." And he said, "Why would I go and see them?" I said, "Because they're wonderful athletes. I see they're finely tuned, trained. I said they dedicate their life to this." He said, who are they? I said, they're Chinese acrobats. He says, how much was the ticket? I said, it's thirty-two fifty. He says, I hope that they would do my laundry as well. Oh. <laughs> that include the laundry. <laughs> well, see, he just left out. I don't know if he disparaged the, uh, the whole uh, Chinese, community. Chinese community with that kind of a stereotype. You could do that if you were Chinese. That's yeah. right. I realized that right at that, uh, you can only make fun of another race, religion, creed, or whatever, if you're a part of that group, it's the <laughs> not if you're outside it. It's the same way that it's easy for a Catholic to make a joke about mea culpa, mea culpa, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, <laughs> <laughs> mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa, and it's very easy for a Jewish broadcaster to, to use all of this, the words, or most of the words anyway. To be like or, Jackie Mason. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Jackie Mason, if he was not Jewish, could never do that whole thing. Right. He couldn't use that shtick. You know, you have to you have to be careful. Yeah, so we talked about happens, that. What happens when he when he does occasionally do that? And, it and does, this, his does a straight man laugh? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, well, like for example, I I, I I I thought of a one liner this morning, and I and I thought about it carefully, and I went ahead and used it, and I hope I was correct. Because I must have been correct. It couldn't be that offensive, but anyway, I took the chance. You know Trevor Burbick, boxer. He, yeah, he's now called Israel T. Burbick, the bo uh, boxer formerly known as Trevor, and he got beaten last night. He was just out of shape and lousy at 40 years old. And I said, as a result of the fight, 
uh, Yitzhak Rabin has turned down his generous offer to allow him to rename his country Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I hope that didn't offend. No, I can't. Uh, see okay, it. but uh, you know, you take. But you wouldn't be you surprised. Have no, you wouldn't else. be surprised. You wouldn't be surprised. It will offend somebody. Oh, someone will well, pick up the phone Somebody who needs who needs a sense of humor yeah. adjustment. And, yeah. Yeah. Or not even just offend somebody, and you but that's, you're prepared to offend somebody. You're just not prepared to offend many somebodies. And no, then we're you, not in the well, business maybe of offending of people. I'm no, not. but you offend somebody. Oh, Sometimes yeah. you have to. You know, you say something yeah. and, and, and you offend somebody. You can't but be, say, it's, re it's re sort of required to be politically correct today. However, if you were politically correct all the time, you would be unemployed. And very boring. Because, yes. I got, it just I've, work. I've got statistical proof and I've had it for a number of years. Lost that 20, <laughs> that 20 to 30 percent of English Montrealers do not think George Balkan is the best morning man in radio. I got proof of that. Yeah. I also got proof that 70 to 75 percent have agreed for 25 years that he is. And I think you've done well by that. <laughs> now, what about off the air? What about getting off the crazy, air? crazy and stupid through the years? When we were younger then, we could do it. We could have and long, longer. We could have long lunches at Swinney's. We did go out for breakfast now and then <laughs> at nine o'clock in the morning at a tavern. What was the name of the tavern? The Devon. It used to, yeah, the Devon the Tavern of, is yeah. where Le Chateau is now. One morning we were was too hungover from yesterday's lunch, so I had to go down to the Devon when it opened at eight o'clock and bring a tray of candles back <laughs> for the across boys. Across the street. Across the street only to uh, get in the elevator and have the next passenger get on, Mac McCurdy, the, the station, station manager. manager. Now we're back where we started, who wanted to fire you? <laughs> yes, that yeah, probably was one of the reasons. <laughs> and with 45 seconds left, we have to wonder whether we let Ted get into another story, have the same thing happen no, no, no. as happened the last time he was here, which is tell oh, nine tenths. No, he didn't stop. <laughs> we, just, we just went long. We had to. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we, oh. we, we got thirty seconds. Here, thanks an awful lot. Oh, it's it's a DJ Morning Show. It's a pleasure. Thank For you. Twenty-five years and probably as long as you guys want to keep doing it, right? Uh, hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I, the friendship has been uh, really more valuable to me than the uh, the working relationship, but both of them. And cut. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a nicer guy in radio than this guy, I want to meet him. Thanks for coming. Thank we'll see you, you next time on the Sports Hot Seat.